I'm here at Cafe Trieste in North Beach in San Francisco, and I've been thinking a lot about Ruth Weiss, who is a beat poet, self-identified as a beat poet, very interested in embracing the beat movement after a while, but unfortunately little known. Uh, she wrote a lot. She was born in Berlin with her family. Uh, as a Jewish family, they fled. The Nazis in the 30s ended up in the Netherlands, and in 1939, which is very late, she got to Chicago with her family. Uh, after a couple of stints in other places, she eventually went to school in Chicago, did very well, felt very alienated. She wound up moving in with some friends in Chicago in a kind of art commune, and in 1952, she hitchhiked, she was very good at hitchhiking, apparently, hitchhiked to San Francisco, where she fell in with the beats. She became a friend of Jack Kerouac. She wrote a lot, and we're very interested in some of her poetry. I'm holding here the Beatitude Anthology of 1960, and Ruth Weiss published in Beatitude a lot during her time and she's anthologized in this, uh, this book, published by City Lights in 1960, with one poem, and we're going to be talking about that poem. On the back of this fairly rare Beatitude anthology, you'll see some scribblings. One says, smoke, Beatitude, it tastes like an abominist shoed. And that is apparently a phrase of Bob Kaufman, who's another unheralded beat poet that we like to talk about. Ruth Weiss, lowercase r, lowercase w. She had a whole thing about capitalization. First of all, she was German and Jewish, and so the persecution of German Jews led her to be alienated from the German penchant linguistically to capitalize nouns. So very interestingly, Ruth Weiss's decision to uncapitalize her name links us with all kinds of important issues in Modpo. Emily Dickinson's penchant for creating occasions, inventing occasions for capitalizing some words and not others. And Gertrude Stein's criticism of the noun as something that names things, delimits things, and denotes things. Ruth Weiss as a beat poet, unheralded as she has been in her time, should be reclaimed in part because she was all about identifying herself. So here we are at Cafe Trieste where apparently Ruth used to hang out and there's still some people who like to hang out. And apparently some beat poets, Latter-day beat poets, like to spend time here at Cafe Trieste. So maybe we'll go in and get some espresso. and we're talking about Ruth Weiss who hitchhiked in 1952 from Chicago and set up life here and became very well known among the beat community and unfortunately is little known today so maybe our conversation will help to revive interest in Ruth Weiss. And we're, we're talking about a poem that's called Poem in this anthology, the Beatitude Anthology published in 1960. And I guess Lily I'm just curious about the tone of this thing. What's your sense of the tone of it? Um, very somber and spiritual, I would say, yeah. almost um, biblical. I have this immediate question I want to ask both of you. Um, Ruth Weiss is a very urban person, Berlin, uh, Amsterdam, I believe, as they were, uh, the family was in exile, then Chicago, then San Francisco. And she did spend some time at Big Sur, as so many beat poets did, but mm -hmm. she's a city poet. So, what is that? automatically, without really knowing anything about her except this poem, it's, what is its attitude toward the city? You say it's spirituality here, but it strikes me as sort of anti-city spirituality, maybe. Um, well, I think there's a, it seems like there's a dichotomy being drawn between hunger and desertion. Mm. So, like, just because you live in a city doesn't mean you like love city. I don't know. It doesn't mean that cities are only good. Yeah. Cities can be both bad and good. Yeah. Jake, what's your take on this attitude well, toward the city here? Maybe um, it's like it's like saying, uh, well, 
there are no people left in New York anymore. It's just all like a different kind of town. Maybe she's saying there's nobody left in the city. Um, in the city that she has left, there's nobody there that she knows any longer. Nobody she can relate to. Maybe yeah. some kind of alienation thing. Lily, is it possible to read this as post-apocalyptic? Yeah, I think so. Um, Why else would the animals have come down from the hills? Yeah, there's. It's post-apocalyptic in the sense that um, people are concentrating into a city. Like there's the hills as an outer ring, and then the village, and then the city yeah. at the center. Yeah. So people are like concentrating into the city. Um, although then it's post-apocalyptic because they get to the city and no one's there. Yeah. So it's a bit circular. Yeah, like it sort of seems like the city is an open pit and as everyone's concentrating there, they're disappearing and more yeah. keep coming in, but they don't, then they disappear once they get there. Yeah. Oh, so you're saying people who were in the city are gone, right? Because we know where the animals are and we know where the villagers are. But the, but villagers, then the villagers are not the city people. The villagers have left for the city. Right, yeah. so they're coming into the city, but what happened to people who were in the city? Right, I'm saying they disappeared. We're recording this on a beautiful fall weekend in San Francisco, and it's Fleet Week. And Lily had to explain what Fleet Week is to me. Do you want to say how you explain it to me? Oh, well, it's just like a week, um, maybe once a year or every couple of months, where um, a naval fleet will come ashore at a city and all of the... Um, naval officers and other people can leave the boat and come into the city. And, and here there's like an air show going they're on. They're celebrating, too. they're celebrating with an air show. And that, that atmosphere just has me think about San Francisco during the Cold War. San Francisco, you know, just across the big pond from the destruction wrought on the Japanese by the atomic bomb. This is an era of atom fears of atomic annihilation. And Ruth Weiss is an escapee from the Holocaust, a Jewish family. So can we go back to the possible post-apocalyptic, post post post-Holocaust implications of this scene? So waves of destruction, um, migrants leaving one spot of destruction, and, and, and gradually, these, these concentric circles of, yeah. uh, of loss. Yeah. So, Lily, you're, it's no secret that you're not a big fan of the Beats. <laughs> uh -huh. So, how would you draw possibly a distinction? This is not a beat seeming poem, it's in the Beatitude anthology. Yeah. What are some differences do you see? Um, well, when we think about like Jack Kerouac as kind of a ultimate beat person um, his attitude of like loving the urban space and its concentration of different kinds of people right. to different sounds making those sounds into the poetry but also a love of big open country right. as kind of a place to fill with his own words and his own space right. um, and we here see like a really like a um, pithy and very dark concentration of all those and collapsing of all those spaces into one and like I see them as kind of collapsing and then just going down a drain like disappearing yeah and there's no noise or sound yeah that's great Jake Jake what do you think of that yeah I mean the economy of words right she's basically reusing most of the words from the first verse and the second verse. right, right. Uh, and um, and yeah, you, like you think about somebody like Allen Ginsberg, you just have the, like these explosions of words yeah. going off. And here you get a completely different, um, you know, the the allegory, the sparseness, the quiet. Then again, the beats were interested in like the haiku type of yeah. Uh, and maybe and her her beat colleagues were interested in the spiritual side yeah. of things. Uh, some of the sentiment here reminds me of Joanne Kiger, Philip Whalen, Gary Snyder, that side of it. One last thing before we stop here. Um, the, the Beatitude Anthology, which was put out by people who really knew Ruth Weiss personally, capitalized R and W, but she was very adamant that her name be printed in lowercase. Yeah. Do we want to say something about that? I mean, it's a, it's, it reminds me of, of Dickinson's 
preference for how she was figured, which kept get violated, violated by people who yeah. published mm. her. Well, it's biblical, right? The lack of capitalization in like ancient Hebrew. You don't have cap capital letters. Yeah. So maybe because yeah. lately you were saying it reminds me of something biblical yeah. and uh, like that kind of epic allegorical feel. Maybe yeah. now that you said it, I was thinking of uh, you know a, maybe spiritual hunger. That's the hunger yeah. that's happening. So, yeah. so maybe um, yeah. maybe that's what she's at going back to. Yeah. Well, she said that she preferred lowercase because the language, her mother tongue, German of course was structured on the capitalization of nouns and proper nouns and she wanted to be provide an alternative mm. to that she's decapitalizing she's decapitalizing her german she's trying to emphasize herself as a kind of survivor the fact that they capitalized it must have been uh, an irritant to her particularly with the sentiment of this poem uh, last thoughts on this do you like this poem jake what do you what do you get from it I've grown to like it more since we started talking about it, because because it is it is very sparse, very uh, very difficult. But if I'm um, kind of Lily's comment about the spiritual element here, the spiritual hunger that might be driving all of this, yeah. uh, I think that that makes it interesting. Yeah, Lily, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, usually, this move from the hills to the village to the city is figured as a positive. Um, upward mobility, American progress. And here she's saying like, first of all, there's no big difference between the people and animals who live outside of the city. They're all driven by the same gnawing, bad feeling. And then they all come to the city and just like step into a void and disappear. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I like that it's not very... Yeah. I like that it, it celebrates the aspect of beat culture that wanted to critically examine the American dream yeah. in a way that is very concise. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's terrific. I, I, I see this as a poem very much of its moment, published in 1960, probably written in 1958 or 59, and it picks up uh, themes of the 1960s that merge with the anti-fascism from which she came. This is a political poem, even though it really doesn't seem to make any explicit mention of it. This is a, this is a, a I would go as far as to say, an anti-nuclear and anti-war poem. Mm -hmm. um, and it has some of that uh, f fearful urgency that some of the political beat poets feel when they think about nuclear annihilation. So thanks. We're Washington Park, Washington Square Park in San Francisco. Talking about Ruth Weiss on a sunny day, what could be better? The animals have come down from the hills to the village because of hunger. The villagers have left for the city because of hunger. The city is deserted, Ruth Weiss. The animals have come down from the hills to the village because of hunger. The villagers have left for the city because of hunger. And the city is deserted. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. But I know her very well. You know well. her? Yeah. Oh. It's called Poem. She's All right, Poem. She's German. She's when German, yes. Yeah. The animals have come down from the hills to the village because of hunger. The villagers have left for the city because of hunger. The city is deserted. It's a pretty great poem, isn't it's it? It's a good poem. I have one of her original... I remember going to a performance that she did, and it was called No, Dan no Dancing Allowed, A-L-O-U-D. Yeah. <laughs> right. I Did you dance? Yeah, we dance. I wonder about Desert yeah. Journal. I have I Desert have a Journal. Yeah, we have it somewhere. God knows. Uh, she gave me a home. So did she live in North Beach for a while? Yes. And then oh, move out? Many she's years gone a long ago. Time. Hey, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you. Please. When I was I was on a ship going around the world, her and her boyfriend at the time, uh, I can't remember his name. It's probably best. Paul. 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 They, they okay. Up they came up from L.A. They were living down in uh, Tepe. Tepanian. Yeah, Tepanga, and then they were in Palestine. And then they stayed at my house, Tepanga Canyon. They yeah. stayed up at my house on Hodges Alley. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. He worked at the Emporium for, for a while so, where I work. He was in uh, the display. Why do you think Ruth is not better known? Because, well, she is known. Yeah. Well, she's better known. She's known locally. But I mean, she's not like known to like 
She's not like Gregory a Corso name like or, a, uh, Corso or Kerouac yeah. or whatever. No, no, probably yeah. not. Except yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, I, I think she, she might be, but she's all over the place. She's, she comes down here all the time.